I'm trying to talk more about our functionality because I don't think that uh, people really know our project. Um, and if somebody wants to go later into how things are deft or, or deeper development stuff, we have a main developer here uh, who can answer questions like that. I'm just like from the uh, usage and administration side of things. So um, we have a, a distributed parallel file system that uh, can do geo-replications with its uh, distribution. We have, we have uh, concentrated on simpl simplicity, I would call it like that. I mean, the, the, the basic idea is if you have tons of data and just need to set up something fast so that you can put it there. We think we have the right solution for that because it's like eight lines of text, eight to ten lines of text to set the whole thing up. Um, so I, I just used the, the example with the t-shirt. I mean, you don't go to a rocket scientist to design you a new place for your data if you just want to uh, store things that you just grabbed from the latest foster. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we are, we are basically, um, the, the, the system has two main components. You have a metadata server and as many chunk servers as you like. Um, I think the limit currently is 1,024 chunk servers. Um, you can store up to one exabyte of data and uh, the setup is very, very simple that, and I will show that later in the demo. I did that yesterday, had some problems because the, <laughs> the connectors were not working, but I can show you that. Hmm? No, just for <laughs> <laughs> um, So there's, there's basically no real learning curve. There are about, there's one command to manage the system. There are about two config files for a master and three for a chunk server that you, that mostly you don't need to touch. The default configuration will do nearly everything for you. The only thing you have to do is to tell the chunk servers where the master is and where you want them to store your data. Yeah, so master chunk servers, we have uh, options to, for HA on your masters. Um, the, w when one of the masters fail, then the one that has the latest uh, version of the data just takes over. The switchover is very, very fast. I think we had uh, in our latest test, it's sub one second that it takes to switch over from one uh, master server to to uh, to a failover one. Um, you can you can mix all kinds of platforms. We have we have our software available for everything that's Unix-like. So I have a setup where I have chunk servers on BSD, on CentOS, on Debian mixed. Um, I even have uh, Solaris chunk servers, and they all work together. So I have a, so the system is basically distributed over all of them. It doesn't really matter. The the uh, the chunks are saved in a normal file system. So the so the performance of your your chunk servers mostly depends how you set up the system under it. 
Um, we mostly use XFS or ZFS for our for our scenarios, but it basically depends what you have and what you like. Um, there is also an option to to uh, use a tape as a chunk server, so that you could basically have replicas of your chunks automatically saved on tape drives. Right, and as I will show you later in the demo, um, you can change your your storage policies on the fly. So basically, if you decide that you want to have three copies of a file in your, in your storage now and later decide that those files are not important anymore and you just need one copy, it's a one-liner, and, and the chunk servers will basically uh, reconfigure that by themselves. Yeah, and uh, you can group your chunk servers. So basically, when you, each chunk server can have a label, and depending how you set your policies, um, you can define that certain data is only safe to certain groups of chunk servers. So let's say you have two chunk servers with SSDs and three chunk servers with hard drives. You just give the chunk servers with the hard drives one label and the ones with the SSD another label. And by defining your policy, you can just, with one line, tell them where the data is supposed to be. Um, besides replication, we also support erasure coding. Um, the, the advantage of erasure coding, besides that you have more space, is that the system then starts striping. So basically, as you set your erasure codes, your system gets parallel writes. So when you use replication, your clients will write to the first chunk server and that chunk server will uh, do the replication. When you use erasure coding, the way you set your erasure codes, let's say three data parts and two parity parts, it will write to five chunk servers in parallel. Right. What kind of size uh, file that you have? Is it possible for files to be the same size? No. I think the smallest will be the smallest will be about 128k, 64k. Under 64k, we will not cut the file in pieces. Yeah, since, since with erasure coding the system is parallelized, you will basically get nearly the same performance from few slow system uh, from few fast systems uh, like from a lot of slow systems right? um, that way it's relatively easy to have an upgrade path where you start with with uh, systems that you have and you can at any time basically replace them on the fly yeah with the with the with the labeling that I talked about you can create some kind of basic tiering because you can set speed labels and uh, define where your data goes to and uh, that's, that's not a replacement for auto tiering yet but it's like a start. You can, you can have as many labels as you want and since the movement is very fast <laughs> it's relatively easy to, to create a manual tiering on your data path. Okay, so we have, a, we have a, a system that we developed for the master server high availability, which is based on the REST protocol and is, uh, and is using a quorum. And the reason why we developed that is that we had quite some problems with uh, using what, what was available there. Um, there were a lot of split brain scenarios and in general the switchover was too slow and with our new 
with our new HA for the master servers, we have, in my experience, under one second uh, switch over time. So the the if you if you uh, configure your policy to be replication, um, the your client will basically send start sending data to the first chunk server, and depending on how many replicas you set, you will it will create a chain reaction. So when the first slice of data goes to the first chunk server, it will start replicating to the next, and so on. Yeah, until all the data is copied and all the replicas are done. That way, you, uh, your client basically is done as soon as he has the data copied to the first chunk server and doesn't have to think about all the replicas. Yeah, we have uh, copy, uh, metadata only snapshots. So basically, it's a copy on first write system. Um, so like in a ZFS system, you would basically have no space occupied by, by your snapshots, and we have no limits on the amount of snapshots right now. Um, the, the system has, when you add disks or you add new chunk servers, the the chunk servers will try to balance out the space um, during write operations. And What? The auto balancing? No, basically if I if if you say set that you want to have three copies of every chunk, um, it will still keep three copies on three different chunk servers. The point is it will try to have the same amount of data on the amount of drives and chunk servers that you have. It's not, uh, unless you use labels, it does not stick to certain chunk servers. So you can set a policy of three, have 20 chunk servers, it will always keep three copies, but it will not tell you where. So it, will, it will distribute and auto balance the data so that all your chunk servers are utilized in the same way. That depends if it's uh, replication or if it's erasure coding. If it's replication, I think it's round robin. No? <laughs> How do you figure out where an object should land? If it, you can either have, if you have it undefined, it will try to balance out by space, right, and, and busyness of, of a certain chunk server. If you have labels, then it will go there where you defined where it should write to. So for instance, if I had object A, it makes a hash modulo the number of disks, and it will land on a disk. That's the idea. It's hash-based placement. It jumps to site otherwise. Yes. Yeah, it's you, you don't speak directly to the chunk server. You speak to the metadata server first and that will tell you where to find your chunk. <laughs>
Yes. Can you speak to us about, you know, is there any method that you can yeah, there is start a with that? Let's like say, oh, I want to take I can show that. two nodes, um, because I, I can I'm just like yes. take them away. It's pretty easy. You just, uh, in, in the chunk server, you have a definition file where you specify the directories where it's supposed to save its data. If you put a star in front of that entry and reload the chunk server, it will empty that directory. So you just wait until all the chunks are moved to a different safe place. And when it's moved, you just switch it off. So drinking is very simple. Yes, unless you have a goal of one, then you're out of luck. So if you don't have replicas set, then as as long as you have uh, as long as you have set your goal so that you have enough replicas, yes, <coughs> it will automatically create new chunks to the next uh, available space. If you have. The only scenario that I had, that I have experienced in the last months where, where we had a problem that actually balanced itself out after a while, funny enough, was somebody took live disks out of one chunk server and shoveled them into another chunk server. <laughs> that was tricky, but it still managed to delete old versions, start replicate stuff around, and it balanced itself out. I was pretty surprised that it managed to do that, but it did. So it's pretty robust. I was looking if anybody has any other questions. So yeah, we, we run, like I said, on, on nearly everything. Um, I personally have tried BSD, CentOS, Debian, um, Solaris, what else? Oh, I have a server and a client on the Mac. Um, there is a commercial Windows client for people that insist on that operating system. Um, I don't think that there is any platform that we couldn't support. I know that there are people running it on ARM um, there is a relatively slow, uh, <laughs> small community for that. There is one university in Germany that wants to set up a rather large ARM scenario. Um, I'm pretty interested how that will work with the new 64-bit ARM. Yeah. So if you have any uh, other adventurous uh, Unix-like <laughs> operating system you would require Desert FS on, we can port that probably as well. The FreeBSD port took about three hours. Yeah. So. Let me just show you. I'll just connect the, the demo computer. I basically created a very small, small setup um, to show how a lizard FS just gets set up in minutes. Uh, hmm? Yeah. wait for the network to wake up. Oops. 
Yeah, so I basically set up a, a, a couple of containers in, in Proxmox. <laughs> Just to show a fast setup. Um, so all I basically do is. Can you invert the terminal code? I try. Just have to get that back. I don't remember how you invert it, but I can at least make it bigger. That one too. <laughs> yeah, but now I don't know where the terminal is. Okay. Ah, okay. So, is that readable? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so basically, we hard coded some stuff. Um, if you don't set uh, a name for the master server and the configuration files, it will assume that it's called MFS master. So all you have to do if you, have a, if you want to do a fast setup is put MFS master in your host file and point it to the IP of your metadata server, right? So basically the MFS master entry um, sets it up. Um, yeah, there's one thing I didn't talk about. That you, you can <laughs> define a topology of your service scenario. Um, you can set which chunk servers should be preferred by which network segment. Right. So that way, if you have a large, complex network infrastructure, you can make certain clients just uh, talk preferably to certain chunk servers. Um, we have a customer that has a large rendering farm with a pretty chaotic uh, network structure. And since they are trying to keep copies of all the data on all the chunk servers so they are close to the, to the rendering nodes, um, they use topology to basically have one client always talk to one chunk server. So what I basically do is I just I just copy the uh, the sample files from the packages <laughs> and I don't change anything. I have to create an empty metadata file. And can just start the metadata server. So. Can just check. Let's get this one again. Yeah. And I and we have a very simple web interface that basically lets you monitor all the stuff. So on that resolution, it's a bit, a bit limited, but you can see you have a started uh, metadata server. You can see how much RAM it has, um, how much RAM it occupies. 
all the metadata is kept in RAM while it's working. So the amount of files you can you can store in the Lizard FS system is basically limited by the amount of RAM you put into your metadata. Um, Yeah, so we have a metadata server basically running. I will attach two chunk servers to it, which is also quite simple. So it's just one package. It's called Lizard FS chunk server. Um, I have created a directory for the chunks. It's called Lizard FS one, and I have two files to configure for that. One is basically, ach, one is basically telling him where he can find it. And the other one is a configuration file where I can keep the default values because I put MFS master into the host file. And you can see I have a chunk server running with four gigabytes of available uh, of available space. So adding another chunk server is just doing exactly the same. And uh, you can see in this example configuration file for the hard disk how you can remove a hard disk. You just put a star in front and it will just redistribute all the chunks to different storage spaces. We have our we, we have our own protocol. Um, it's a fuse based client. Um, we are working on some other clients currently. Um, one is a native client for QMU. That should be released pretty soon. <laughs> um, another one is uh, an emulation interface for HDFS, so that you can connect uh, Hadoop-like systems to it. And there is a plan to release an NFS conversion, so that you could locally connect via NFS, and it would uh, speak Lizard on the network side. Do you have plans to support multi-tenancy? Multi-tenancy in, in which way? Uh, having different users that can mount uh, a shared storage with quotas and uh, different users not seeing each other's files. So we have a full POSIX implementation. That's not the same thing. And you can define rights for hosts per directory and per subdirectory. It's basically similar how you would do an NFS setup. So you define on the master which part of your namespace you want to be available to which clients, basically. So, so the rest of the namespace would not be visible for the clients? If it won't be totally visible, you can inhibit reads, but I don't know if it will not show you that there is a directory available. Which database are we using for metadata server? It's in memory data structure created by us. What language did you implement C? What, uh, what's the performance like if I have a rack full of high end servers with uh, 10 gigabit SFT links? Is that something I can saturate? Um, Depends. It depends how many streams you have. Single speed currently is about 600 megabytes. Um, the <coughs> the QMO driver seems to be a bit faster, has about 750 megabytes <coughs> in our last test. Um, but that's per single stream. So for example, if you would do KVM hosting, 
we usually do one mount per virtual machine and each mount would have 750 megawatts. So yes, you could saturate it, but not with a single stream. Okay. Is this a good choice for uh, uh, metadata heavy workloads like Mabius? Like? Mabius. Like media? Mabius, email storage. <sighs> If, the, if it's mail storage with single small files, not yet. It's uh, like we said before, if it's under 64K, the file will not be split, so you will not really have distribution and the performance would go down. <coughs> any object plus you can ah one thing yeah I don't have the client now here but um, you can change the policy with one command um, on any object so you can set a goal of two now for your directory and change it to a goal of three just saying lizard fs set goal three and it will immediately start creating the next replica so you can move from EC2 plus 1 to uh, replication of 5 just with a one-liner, which is quite interesting if you want to do backups. If you, have, uh, if you have chunk servers that are defined as tape drives, you could just do a policy change on the directory and you would have automatic backups to LTO tapes. And you get it back by changing the policy on that directory with another line. Do you have an idea of the ratio of storage to the load? Yes. Files, amount of files per RAM. I have a table, but I don't remember it. <laughs> yeah. One second, I get you the table. I, I can give an example running it at a school level for, and we have about 50 million files, and it takes about 14 weeks to round. Yes. So, let me go here. So you have a, there's a client, um, the client has a config file where you basically define your mount point. If you want, you can just you can also do it on the command line. But I can't type today anyway. And basically, all you have to do is if that directory exists. Yeah. Um, Again, the, it has to know where the MFS master is. If you use a different name for your metadata server, you have to set it in the configuration file. If not, it works right out of the box. And there's your, your directory, it's mounted. And actually, let's say we has a goal of one, so there's only one replica. Um, it doesn't really make sense to set a different goal now. I just have one chunk server, right? So <coughs> setting a different goal would just be two, three, five, ten to that password, and it would distribute as many chunks. So if you're just setting one chunk server, would you Would, yeah. And it would wait for you to add more chunk servers. So once you add a new chunk server, it would automatically start uh, creating new chunks back. Yes. Um, it creates 
it creates, uh, it dumps the memory to disk every, Piotrek, how often do we dump the, the metadata to disk? Yeah, so we create one dump per hour and you can set it up in the configuration to do it more often. Plus you can create so-called meta loggers that will constantly log all changes to your metadata server. Yes. What kind of integration tests do you run? Integration tests. That is, you deploy a server. Yes. We mostly do load tests with any tool that I can find. I mean, it's like um, the, the test for 3.10.6 was like I had about 12 chunk servers and I was bombarding it from multiple streams with IOMeter, IOZone, and FIO at the same time and then started kicking chunk servers out. <laughs> um, I think for, for redundancy testing, that's good enough constant 100% load is, is always a nice test. There is nothing that you can do more than that, actually. What methods can you use to make the metadata server highly available? So, we have members of the community that basically have uh, tried it with, yeah. we have uh, our own system, but that's a commercial solution that we invented. Um, that's based on the raft algorithm. Um, but it's your choice. Right? <laughs> yes? Uh, so the mount point on the chunk server can be any file system, correct? Yes, it's just a directory. Yes, so is there an identification mixing different file systems? No. Some, some behave differently, performance-wise. OK, you have a performance uh, impact on what you choose, but it will always be in the replication. I don't think I, I don't see really a big impact if you use replication, but there will be a very big impact if you use erasure coding because your writes are parallelized, and you will always have the performance of the slowest chunk server in the write uh, because the write will only be finished if all the chunk servers in that stripe set are done. Yes, I actually have the same experience as the Seth guys that everything that starts with EX is not really a good choice. Um, we have quite nicely worked with, F with XFS and for very high performance we have ZFS setups with all tuning that you can do there. Um, with ZFS your only limit is that you shouldn't fill your file system more than 80% because then your performance goes like mm. Ah, okay, I can. You, I can answer any question, but after that, because time's up. <coughs> Thank you.